So this is a uh, very brief introduction and an update uh, about the Kronos Group, what we do, and uh, in particular the, the standards that we're helping to create for augmented reality. So for those of you who have not come across the uh, Kronos Group before, uh, we're a, an open standards organization. We create uh, royalty-free standards that connect uh, silicon to software. Uh, we have everyone from Google and Apple, uh, Nokia, uh, all the way down to uh, small startup companies that want to get you know, an inside track and a voice uh, in how these uh, standards are being uh, evolved. Um, we're probably best known uh, for our graphics APIs, OpenGL, uh, OpenGL ES, our 3D graphics APIs. Uh, increasingly, uh, we have OpenCL being deployed, both on desktop machines and uh, actually here at the show, uh, the first uh, isolated pockets of OpenCL being demonstrated on uh, mobile devices. Uh, OpenCL is a, a parallel computation uh, framework. One standard that's not an API is Collada. It's a 3D asset file format. It's intended to be a uh, authoring interchange format. We're going to actually do some work related to Collada, which I'll explain uh, in a moment. Um, the new wave of uh, mobile processing is not graphical output, it's sensor input, uh, particularly using uh, the camera, obviously, for vision processing, very relevant to augmented reality. Uh, but in a broader sense, uh, bringing together all of the sensors on a mobile device, uh, typically called sensor fusion, uh, using uh, the combination of sensors in a smart way. And we're creating APIs to uh, enable uh, application developers to tap into the sensors uh, in, a, in an easy way. I'll explain a little bit about this. Is a uh, vision acceleration uh, uh, API. Uh, there have been uh, standards like OpenC OpenCV, which, despite the kernel sounding name, it's not a kernel standard. Uh, it's an open source project. There's actually no specification. It's an open source project that has many contributors. And it's an extensive uh, library of vision functionality, but it's not really designed to be accelerated. There's been thousands of functions. Uh, the silicon vendors like NVIDIA, you kind of try and pick up a couple dozen of the functions, but then it's like a thousand more to go. Um, and all the silicon vendors, uh, we kind of choose a different subset of functions to accelerate. So it's not an ideal acceleration platform. Uh, OpenVX is intended to be a much smaller. Um, set of fundamental building blocks for vision acceleration uh, that the silicon vendors can implement uh, uh, completely and reliably across different platforms. And then we can have applications, libraries like OpenCV or other higher libraries feeding into OpenVX and they'll be able to tap down into vision acceleration. And I think you're going to see hardware provision acceleration increasingly in mobile devices. It gives more better performance and lower, lower power. So um, there's quite a broad um, selection of the Kronos members are interested. Um, a lot of the silicon vendors are participating um, in uh, OpenVX. Uh, we're aiming to have uh, the uh, final release specification uh, in the second half of 2013. At the, at the lowest level, the, the key difference between VX and OpenCV is it's designed to be very efficient at the hardware level. So you can create essentially a graph of the processing uh, nodes that you want uh, your image to go through. And there'll be a runtime component to OpenVX that lets you plug in hardware, if you have it, uh, into any of those nodes, and the silicon vendors will take care of uh, how that data flows efficiently through the nodes. Um, you abstract that away so the software developers don't have to worry about that level of detail, and it gives the hardware vendors the capability to implement it in the best way for their particular hardware. So, uh, from the application developer's point of view, you can just set up a, up a graph and it'll run uh, optimally on whatever platform uh, you're running on at the time. Uh, sensor fusion, <coughs> sensor fusion is, a, is a really interesting uh, topic. Uh, most of the 
APIs in the platforms are very low level uh, and a little bit broken in, in various ways. Uh, the, the Android APIs, they say they're low level, but they've actually done some massaging, so you don't actually get the raw data. And the most application developers um, aren't sensor fusion experts. They don't know that you know, a gyro takes m much more power than an accelerometer. Uh, it's, you know, gyro compass can be effective if you walk through the metal frame of the door. And if you are a sensor fusion um, person, you know, you're, you know you have to combine the sensors in, in quite sophisticated ways to give you a high quality, uh, high frequency uh, sensor stream. And we want to enable uh, ISVs to tackle into the power of combined sensors uh, in a high level way. So what Stream Input does, it uh, enables an application developer to request semantic sensor information. Uh, so if you're using it like a depth camera to so give you skeleton tracking information, um, or if you want to do context aware processing, you can say, you know, tell me if I'm being carried in a pocket or in a backpack or in an elevator, or this person's driving a car. You know, we have the sensor capability to detect all of that. Um, you don't need to know how the sensors are being used. You just ask for that information, and the stream input will construct a graph using the sensors on the device to uh, provide the best quality uh, sensor data stream that that device is, is capable of. We're also um, addressing um, some topics that are vital to the AR community, uh, actually providing timestamps for all of the sensors in a system. So for example, you can tell whether your camera and uh, your accelerometer and gyro uh, where they are in relation temporarily. So you can actually use them in a synchronized way. It's actually very hard to do that with the existing APIs on most platforms today. So we have the camera with open maps, we have uh, the sensor is coming in with stream input. Uh, we have OpenVX for doing the vision tracking. Uh, OpenGLES for the 3D rendering. Uh, OpenSLES is the audio API that we do. And then increasingly, as I say, OpenCL on mobile uh, is just happening right now. And I think that's a really, uh, it's going to be a really interesting development over the next year or two. Uh, OpenCL, it, its framework, um, the Mobile SOCs, you know, the, the processors inside mobile devices, there's a whole bunch of processing power in there. There's typically a quad-core uh, CPU complex and uh, a multi-pipe uh, GPU, uh, as well as all of the, uh, the hardware for doing vision and uh, video acceleration. Um, so OpenCL is a framework that lets you take your compute load and you effectively use CPUs and GPUs uh, all from one programming uh, framework. This, this is running in real time. It's not on the mobile device yet. Uh, it's on a uh, CUDA accelerated uh, laptop. So that glass is not there. That glass is uh, virtual. But you can see that the level of accuracy that's interacting with the environment, the fact that it's refracting objects that go behind it, it's casting a realistic uh, shadow. Um, so that metal bracelet is, is not there. And okay, they did a sign yeah, okay. Okay, okay. They did a, they did a uh, user testing to ask people which one was the real bracelet and which one was the, uh, the virtual bracelet. More people chose the virtual bracelet than the real bracelet. Right. And see the cost of reflections there. I mean, this, did this pass? To the, this was the first time this passed in real time past the reality that I actually had to. Yeah. Oh, it, no, oh my God, it's not there. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so it, it's quite a complex object. Now, there's a lot of computation going on here. It's not just 3D graphics anymore, and it's yeah. not just a vision tracking. They're, they're calculating a, a, a light field for the scene, and then they're doing ray tracing. Um, it's a lot of computation. So, the little cooler accelerated laptop was coming away <laughs> red hot. But soon we're going to get OpenCL in mobile devices and we'll be, to be able to enable you know, this level of uh, realism uh, on tablets and phones. It's coming.
We actually have a couple of web standards. One is actually shipping today, one is close to shipping. Uh, WebGL uh, binds OpenGL G Open ES into JavaScript. Um, it's been used in Google Maps, um, in the production of Google Maps today. Uh, WebCL is a JavaScript binding into the OpenCL API that we just saw. The yellow blocks are things that we are discussing with the web community that we think potentially we can bind, bind more of the native APIs into JavaScript. So a WebSL for audio, uh, a WebVX for doing vision processing in the web, um, and stream input. You know, this has been a lot of uh, effort to bring sensors into the browser, but they haven't been very successful. Uh, so far, and perhaps that we can help uh, with that. So, there are some examples. This is some um, Google Maps, uh, even the 2D. Uh, Eternal Maps GL is an option you get in your bottom left hand corner when you bring up maps. Uh, if you turn that on, even your 2D maps are being accelerated through WebGL. But because WebGL is a 3D API, um, you can have this quite sophisticated scene uh, interaction. Uh, everything is being uh, accelerated on the GPU hardware. Um, this is in a hard street view. Um, and of course, you have to remember, this is not anything more than a web page. So web pages that can now be quite sophisticated. WebCL is a um, specification that we're aiming to release around mid-year this year, so we're getting quite close to uh, releasing this. There are already um, some web um, work that we do. We actually have a couple of web standards. One is actually shipping today, one is close to shipping. Uh, WebGL uh, binds OpenGL G Open ES into JavaScript. Um, it's been used in Google Maps, um, in the production of Google Maps today. Uh, WebCL is a JavaScript binding into the OpenCL API that we just saw. The yellow blocks are things that we are discussing with the web community that we think potentially we can bind, bind more of the native APIs into JavaScript. So a WebSL for audio, uh, a WebVX for doing vision processing in the web, um, and stream input. You know, this has been a lot of uh, effort to bring sensors into the browser, but they haven't been very successful uh, so far, and perhaps that we, we can help uh, with that. This is um, Google Maps, uh, even the 2D. Uh, Eternal Maps GL is an option you get in your bottom left hand corner when you bring up maps. Uh, if you turn that on, even your 2D maps are being accelerated through WebGL. But because WebGL is a 3D API, um, you can have this quite sophisticated scene uh, interaction. Uh, everything is being uh, accelerated on the GPU hardware. So the, this is an, an example of how uh, you can use it in the web. So this is a simple WebGL uh, application, two spheres um, in Union Square in San Francisco. Um, now if you want to make these you know, more sophisticated objects, in this case we just turn on like a jet wobble which is very computationally intensive. Um, when you do all that computation in JavaScript, the thing slows right down because you're doing hundreds of megaflops. And JavaScript is not the ideal API for doing computationally intensive tasks like that. If we use WebCL, tap into the power of OpenCL, and just load all of that computation onto the GPU, uh, then the jet model goes back into real time. And again, this is just a web page. Uh, using these web uh, APIs. Obviously, this is a simple example, but you can imagine having physics engines in JavaScript tapping down into WebCL, for example, for uh, quite sophisticated interaction within a web uh, environment. The last thing I want to talk about is um, something that we have a session tomorrow afternoon, mm -hmm. just to give a flavor of what we're going to be discussing. Um, the need for a 3D transmission format, um, particularly with augmented reality, where you're, you have a remote client roaming around in the real world, and the browsers, um, by definition, hooked into a network. Uh, we need a way to bring those 3D assets that we want to display uh, efficiently down into uh, the client. And it's not fair, because 
3D is the last data type that doesn't have a way of doing it. Um, audio has MP3, and you know, Napster happens. Right? It, once you enable these media types to be transmitted efficiently, it creates new commercial opportunities. Uh, video now has H.264, and you know, YouTube happens. And also you have JPEG for a long time um, for our images. We don't have anything for 3D. Hopefully JSON is, has a lot of momentum, and we think we can efficiently describe the 3D scene graph using JSON. Um, one of the reasons why I think 3D is the last uh, type to have its compression format is it's much more complex. No. Video is like a very small set of use cases of what you're going to do with the video. It's a different bit rates and stuff like that, but it's basically a simple use case. Uh, 3D, I mean, how would you stream 3D? Where you can stream the geometry first and then the textures, or uh, multiple levels of geometry, or a section of the 3D scene first. And it is just very complex how you would use uh, 3D assets on a client. And so we think a way to break that combinatorial complexity is to take a web services approach to this and use the REST APIs for the client and the, and the host to negotiate um, how they want to use the assets and how the server should prepare uh, the assets for, for the client. So we're working on a JSON single encoding. We actually have a prototype converter. Um, which is just like an example, you don't have to use it, but um, it's planted to JSON, that's up on GitHub, it's open source, so people can take a look as it develops, but they'll be prototyping it in parallel <coughs> with developing uh, the format. Um, so this is the way you would use it. Um, you'd uh, send the scene graph from the server to the client, uh, the client would use the REST APIs to uh, negotiate how it wants the assets to be sent, and then you encode the assets and send it down and decode them uh, at the client. So the, the compression uh, advantage <coughs> comes from can we find in the industry good uh, compression techniques to for the JSON scene graph to refer to what we call it the the the, the, um, the asset payload. Um, and we could have a whole bunch of these, and we need to find the right balance between having enough so. The use cases are met, but not having too many, but it becomes too confusing. We're talking to MPEG, and they've offered some of their um, compression uh, formats. We're all doing great. Uh, Web3D has, has been doing a lot of work in this, so we want to make sure that we can use uh, the Web3D work as well. Um, Google has been doing stuff, they did some compression techniques for Google Body. So we want to talk to anyone who's willing to provide technology royalty free, and then we can normatively link. Uh, to them as uh, a standardized payload format. So this is the kind of liaison that we uh, imagine. And so this is the simplified version where Chronos is going to do GLTF. Um, and we're, we're committed to do it in the open so people can feedback, we can take requirements, we can take requirements. And we're committed to deliver that in 2013. Uh, and we'll do the cloud to JSON as an example, convert it. Um, and then we want to work with JPEG and Web3D and others to define both the REST APIs and the asset payload formats. Um, and then the last slide, because we have Mipi here, it's good to, um, Kronos is open to um, liaisons where it makes commercial sense and there's a reason to do it. And when we look at uh, uh, potential liaisons, there's four dials that we look at. Um, how we can make, deal with intellectual property, confidentiality, copyrights, and membership, and we can go very loose on each of those styles, or if we need to, we can go you know, do some more paperwork. Um, 